uh, we're so happy to have you here today uh, with us watching, if not now, later. And I really hope you can help us to spread these conversations further and further. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am Gabriela Dilaccio. I'm a soprano. I'm also the founder of the project Donne Women in Music. This project um, biggest aim is to promote and support uh, women in music and, and really um, help to change or help to create change in the current inequality that we find uh, in the music industry. Yes, we are very ambitious, but we have to aim high. And I really hope these conversations will help us to uh, raise the awareness and to spread the word uh, with many, many more people. So my guest today, I'm really, really happy to be to have with us today a uh, British composer, Anna Appleby. Welcome, Anna. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. She's a composer based in Manchester, UK, and she specializes in writing for opera and dance. I think that's wonderful as a singer, of course. She is currently uh, a composer in residence with Glyndebourne and also studying a PhD at the Royal Northern College of Music, which will culminate in an opera premiere with the BBC Philharmonic. And collaboration is at the heart of her creative practice. I love the way you described that, Anna. And um, to, before we go into our subject, I wonder if you can, could tell us a little bit more about your journey as a composer. When did you realize you wanted to follow this path? Who inspired you? Just tell us a little bit about you. Thanks, Gabby. Thanks for that lovely introduction as well. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about me. Um, when I was about uh, 15 or 16, um, I'd been trying to write pop songs for a few years, but I'd never tried to write anything classical. Okay. And um, I was in a youth orchestra playing the oboe, and I had this revelation when we were touring that actually I could spend all of my time doing something. Before that point, I just sort of jack of all trades, love, loved everything and was also bored by everything. <laughs> and suddenly here was something I could actually commit to. Um, I had this just amazing sense of, wow, I could, I could do music every day for yeah. a long time and not get bored of it. And I've never felt that way about anything before. Um, I had a very short. Oh, how old were you? How old were you? Fifteen or sixteen? Oh wow! Um, I think maybe sixteen, but it was sort of gradual as well because I, I'd been playing in this orchestra for a couple of years, and it did change my life. Um, I suddenly felt like I belonged in the classical music world, whereas before that point, I'd always felt like I love folk, I love jazz, I love pop, I love everything. I didn't really have yeah. a sense of, of having a kind of musical family. Um, so at that point, I realized that I could actually compose all the time, um, sorry, play music all the time. And then that led me to trying, um, trying out something new, which was composing. But the thing that actually started it was I hurt my shoulder and I couldn't play the piano or the oboe at all oh. for, um, a year. And I thought, oh, well, I still need to do music. So I tried to write it and I had no idea what I was doing. I thought I was the first female composer ever. In <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I a vacuum, you know, I had, I had no awareness or, or knowledge of all the women who'd gone before me, but I just thought, um, I want to do this. I like doing this. I'm going to be the first woman to do it. And that just tells <laughs> ever. me what the first was woman like, ever. Yeah. First woman ever. <laughs> right. It's, it's, uh, it's quite funny when I talked to uh, Rachel Portman, she also told me that she uh, decided really soon, really early, um, that what she wanted to do. And she said she feels really lucky for that ha that happened in her life. Uh, and I bet you feel the same because I think knowing what you want to do so early is, is really a gift. It's kind of a a present. I, I feel it the same because I always knew I wanted to do music somehow. 
Absolutely. It was like a spiritual calling, actually, I'd say. Um, I just had this deep sense of I need to write music. And I was obsessed for for a long time. My mum would have to call me down for dinner when usually I'd be like running down the stairs like, when's food ready? When's food ready? (laughs) And I was so obsessed with writing music that I would just forget that anything else was happening. I could just sit at my chair like this, hunched over my keyboard for, you know, hours. And you Um, would write on the piano? Yeah, I would always write in my little, I had a little keyboard. Um, I still have that keyboard, actually. It's the same one I have in my little, my little office. Um, Because I've got an emotional connection with it now. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it was the only thing that would, that would, uh, take my focus for that long. Before that point, I would be distracted by food. I mean, I love food still, but I would just always be thinking, when's the next meal? When's the next meal? I don't, I don't care about anything else. <laughs> At school, my focus would go in lessons. I'd be trying to snack under the desk or like uh, draw. I drew, I drew all the time as well. I used to doodle. Yeah. And suddenly here was something I could actually focus on. Um, yeah. And um, then you followed up from, from there, never, did something else? No, I've just been obsessed. But now, now that I'm a bit more comfortable in myself, I'm starting to do some other things again, like art. I've gone back to looking at art and, and writing, writing yeah. as well, and um, just broadening out a bit now because it's ten years later. <laughs> and then to 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 get into this career, how was it for you after you graduated, and how how did you feel uh, the beginnings? Because I think now it's, it's, it's really wonderful for you. You're having these amazing opportunities and you're, you're so talented. And, but I, I'm sure you will agree with me. There are so many talented people as well. And they probably want to know a little bit from you. How, how was your journey? Because they probably want to try uh, to do their best as well. Yeah, so my journey was quite... Um... It was quite hard because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know there'd been any other, I didn't know any composers. I didn't know how to be a composer. Um, I just thought, right, very logically, if I want to be a professional musician, I should do a music degree. So I realized at that point, I hadn't even taken music AS level, which is oh. the, it, it, if anyone who has different exam systems, it's it's the penultimate year of school. Um, I. I'd, I'd taken art instead. I hadn't really known what to choose. And, and during that time, I had this revelation that actually I wanted to do music. So I had to go to my teachers at school and say, please, 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 can I take music now, even though it's late in the year? And I was so possessed that they let uh-huh. me do it. <laughs> um, and I had to take the whole music A level a bit, a bit late. Um, yeah. I had to start learning it quite late. So that was quite difficult. And then I applied to university, applied to Oxford to do music. I thought, aim high, fare as well. Um, and, I, and I didn't even have any music qualifications from school. I had my GCSE, yeah. which is the one you do when you're about 14 or 15. Yeah. And I had my, um, my piano and my oboe exams. So I had something. But I took these yellowing papers with my scribbles of music on, handwritten, to, into Oxford to an interview. <laughs> <laughs> and I handed them shakily across the desk um, to Professor Martin Harry, who was very, very kind, and he saw some potential in me. So I was very grateful to him. I think he liked the uh, romantic ideal that I had come from, like nowhere, with these like yellowed papers no technology no knowledge Uh, (laughs) i think he found it quite funny and um fresh yeah yeah so that was very lucky for me that he saw some potential and then my oxford degree was very very hard i i I struggled a lot and actually that's something i'm going to talk about a bit in this um and then i went on to do a master's in composition because um i did better than i expected in my (laughs) degree i thought oh maybe now I can do another degree and, and actually just compose rather than doing all of music. You know, yeah. music degree is just kind of everything. Um, yeah. So that master's was when I really learned that I didn't know anything about composing at all. <laughs> um, well, the more you learn, the more you learn. We don't know much. <laughs> it's always like exactly. that. And I had very nice, um, kind, supportive supervisors in my master's as well. I had um, 
Professor David Horn and Professor Adam Gorb, they were really encouraging too. Um, so these teachers have helped me a lot on my way, seeing potential and, and encouraging me. But I've, always, I've always also had this burning passion inside. Yeah. Um, and then I tried to go freelance straight after my master's and it was very difficult. So I'm going to talk about that as well. And then um, after three years of that, my dream PhD came along and somehow I've been lucky enough to get that. And now, now I have Professor Emily Howard as my supervisor. Um, it's very nice having a female supervisor for the first time. Um, they've all been wonderful, but it is a nice change as well. Yeah. And I'm writing an opera, so oh, that's yeah, that's, that's a summary of my journey. Yeah, I'm quite curious about the subject you chose. And uh, so could you explain a little bit more, what, I mean, what being a, a big disappointment means to you? Then we talk about what is a to be a happy artist but let's talk about um your why 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 do you feel like you were a big disappointment or sometimes you we can all be a big disappointment talk us a bit more about that so i chose this title because i think it i think it will connect with a lot of people especially people who are either very ambitious and put very high standards on themselves or who have quite ambitious parents or um, have felt a lot of pressure from society or teachers or, or people around you. Um, I think we all feel that pressure and that expectation. I chose it for me because, um, you know, when I was little, I was about six years old, I decided that I was going to be prime minister, that I was going to save the environment. My mum always told me about the environmental crisis, so I thought, right, I'm going to save the planet. Uh, thank goodness Sorry. we have Greta Thunberg now. And so <laughs> I yes. thought I'm going to. Yeah, I thought I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be a famous artist, and I'm going to be. Um, I'm going to be in movies. I'm going to be a famous actress. I had all these incredibly ambitious dreams, but that meant that when I became a teenager, I got very, very stressed because little child me, um, whether it was my parents, my teachers, I don't know, but for some reason I had all these very huge weight, this huge weight of expectation. And I realized as a teenager that life is very hard and that I couldn't actually live up to all these things. A <laughs> few. <laughs> yeah, they were a bit mad as well. Like a bit. I don't. I don't want to be prime minister. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and it wasn't really about so much what I wanted. I think I just thought that. Um, I think for some reason I thought I had to do. I had to do these. I had to change the world. I had to do um, something incredible, which I think is good because you need to have dreams. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just remember going through this phase as a teenager when I just realised I couldn't live up to anything that I put on myself or that people me and that I didn't know you know what I was saying I couldn't focus on anything at all I just couldn't there was no subject that I really thought this is me and I love this and I'm good and I'm good enough to do this mm -hmm. um, and then music sort of just took me on this journey and, and made me realize that actually I didn't have to know what I was going to become I could just choose something I actually love doing now in in the present moment. At the same time, I had that goal that I did want to be a composer, but I didn't even know really what that meant. I just knew one day somebody will play my music in a concert and it will be amazing. And that was my, that was my dream. I didn't know anything else. And I just, the first time that happened, the first time I had some music played in a concert, I was so emotional because that was that was enough you know I realized that was actually a big enough dream for me at the time and um, yeah it just took a lot of pressure off I think to realize that all these expectations I put on myself about what success is and what I was supposed to become yeah I can't know that and actually you have to look at what you love doing so I think that that was the reason I chose this um, but there's some other things to do with the title as well like you know, every day I, I feel like I put big expectations on myself for the day. And I also feel like other people have really strong expectations of me as a woman. And we can talk about that later. Um, and I have, I think in general society puts huge expectations on us as people. So um, 
I think it connects to a lot of things. I, th I think this feeling of feeling like a disappointment comes and goes for everybody yeah. in, in our lives, in our careers. Uh, do you feel do you feel that women would have this more than men? Or do you think women have the the wish to please people more? Because I think there is also this tendency of uh, not disappointing people in a, with your artistic voice sometimes or do something that will please more people. Or how do you find that as a composer? How uh, how long did it take for you to actually find your own voice and stick to it and understand that you are not going to please everybody? We, we know that as artists. Mm -hmm. But it's not a, an easy thing to accept in, in real life, of course. It's very nice to talk about, yes, I did find my own voice and I know I can't please everybody. But, you know, in real life, that still hurts sometimes. Mm -hmm. How is that? How does it work for you? So do you feel that you have this journey? So, sorry, these journeys of going back and forwards. How we do take yourself out of this frame of mind of feeling that you are a disappointment somehow sometimes? Yeah, so kind of two big things we can talk about there. I think they do link together really closely. Um, one is how is it as a woman? And one is how do how do I kind of combat that? I think um, the reason I chose this topic for Donna Women in Music, I think is that a lot of women feel this pressure to be either the woman who has it all, you know, having children, family, career, beauty, success, money, everything, to have all those things. Um, but also women women have these huge obstacles in our way as well because of sexism and misogyny, which means that we are gonna maybe encounter more disappointments and failures as a result. And it's not always gonna be our fault. Um, so I think it's gonna resonate with a lot of people um, because of that. And, and when I'm thinking about gender, um, you know, men men have huge pressures on them as well, and men aren't supposed to be in a lot of societies and cultures still, and a lot of people feel this way still. Um, men are expected to be the breadwinners, they're not supposed to show as much emotion. So I think hand in hand, when women are allowed to be more ambitious, men should men need to be allowed to be more caring and gentle so that so that we're all more free um because you need that balance in society because there's lots of jobs that need to be done like yes. children need to be looked after and things you know money needs to be earned so who's going to do those roles and that's that shouldn't be all based on gender and i think this is um that's just the wider topic but within that i think um oh oh did i disappear yes um I think the thing is, um, women aren't given a huge amount of space to develop their personality. I think for women, there's always a sense of looking outwards, looking around, uh, reflecting, um, not not creating this energy from within and, and disrupting. You know, and, and being an artist, you have to disrupt. You have to create this energy, and you have you have to respond as well. But I think um, it can be very hard as a woman to actually know who you are um, because you are told so often to to reflect and to fit in. Um, and also, I think men who are forced into roles that don't suit them feel this way too. But let's just talk about women for now. I think that um, women are expected to be beautiful and well-behaved and graceful and things that actually art doesn't sit well with that all the time. You, you need to have a grace and an elegance in some kinds of performance um, and beauty is a huge part of art. So I think that that is a very important aesthetic and aspect, but you have to say difficult things and, and be funny as well and be um, challenging and political and, and I think um, what oh, and, and, and aggressive if you want to be or having a more uh, is that mm -hmm. a story of Elizabeth McConkie you know that when she was writing her music people used to say that oh your music is too masculine or uh, so it's, it's really strange that the stereotypes that people still have it of course this was a while ago but I wouldn't be surprised if 
we would hear comments like that or the vice versa as well. You know, men can be delicate and, and this is really obvious, but somehow uh, I think people still have some unconscious bias of how certain genders should behave in certain professions or in life. And I think we keep fighting this on a daily basis uh, in certain careers for women more than others, I guess. Uh, can we talk about being happy then? No. Yeah, I just want to finish one little thing from that that I meant to say, which was that um, I think that crucially as a, as a woman, you can't win in the way that if you try and please everybody. So the disappointment thing is crucial because if you try to please people by being, by emulating the success that you see men having, you will either lose potentially a sense of yourself because you're trying to be like a man or if you are feminine and, and emulate femininity, you'll be accused of only being able to do womanly things. And that's been always the case with female composers. They get the same criticism, either they're being too masculine or they're being too feminine. And it's very, very difficult. And I think men have to navigate this as well, because if they create, um, maybe not so much when they're creating art, but when they're just being themselves and being their persona, you know, they're always being watched for what kind of masculinity they're portraying. I think, you know, gender is a huge thing with, with disappointment. Basically, I gave up. I said, okay, I'm a mixture. I'm masculine. I'm feminine. I'm not going to please everybody. In fact, I can't please anybody most of the time. So I've just got to please myself and be myself. And as an artist, I'm just going to be me. And sometimes I'll be feminine and sometimes I'll be masculine and whatever. I'm just going to Screw that. So this connects to how to be happy. I think you have to just let go of needing to please everybody because it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. Firstly, it's impossible. Yeah. Secondly, it's unreasonable because actually society puts so many expectations on us of what we should be. And most of these expectations are set by people who are in power and want to hold on to that power. Um and that's the case with gender, but it's also the case with money. And that's something we'll talk about a bit later as well, I think. Um, so yeah, being happy, I think, is letting go of the pressures and expectations that, that you have put on yourself as a result of society putting them on you. Maybe your parents, maybe your peers, maybe the media that you watch. Um, it can be quite hard to unpick. It can be quite hard to work out who you are after all of that. <laughs> And I don't have any answers because, you know, I'm 26, I'm going through all this turmoil and questioning, but it's just something that I want to think about a lot at the moment um, because I'm looking at how hard I've worked for 10 years and I've achieved a lot of things, but the things that actually bring me happiness aren't necessarily the things that look the most impressive or, or look like the things I'm supposed to want to achieve. Sometimes the thing that makes me happiest is having a day off and sunbathing and eating lots of good food and enjoying being alive and not worrying about the fact maybe somebody else is working harder than me and achieving more. Yeah, um, it's a comparison, isn't it? Especially now in lockdown, I think we're all going through that, you know? Yes. Do, do you have a comparison uh, is, is a, a huge thing that happens to all of us at some point. Did you ever suffer that? At some point in your career, I know that we all uh, go back and forwards and try not to because uh, sadly, I think, I don't know why, very early uh, in our education, I think in music, you only think only a few people can succeed. I think, I don't know why we've been taught that. That's what I felt. I don't feel this anymore. I feel like the world is so big and there are so many people who like different things. And I think there is space for a lot more people that we were told to believe. And it doesn't matter in which level of careers or which genre of music. But I think at the beginning of my career, I, I had this thing, oh my God, only very few people will survive, only a very few people will, will make it. And, and I kept comparing myself with the ones who were already there and then constantly feeling I'm not there. I'm, how can I get there or or comparing myself with people who were completely the opposite of me, which I would never in a million years become anything closer to that person. So did you ever have that? Did you um, 
suffered the comparison disease, please don't, people. Just get out of it. <laughs> I think we all do, and I absolutely do. I think social media sometimes makes it harder because it encourages envy, you know? It encourages comparison. Oh, I've got fewer likes, I've got fewer followers, I'm doing it wrong. And actually, social media is added to this trick, this sense that there's a way of counting how well you're doing. There's, there's, a, there's numbers. So it's either money or it's followers or it's likes or it's something that you can count. And actually in the arts, you can't count that. It's, you know, the most, the biggest successes I've had are when somebody's come up to me after a concert with tears in their eyes saying, your piece moved me. And maybe like, maybe it was just a little local church concert and there were 12 people in the audience, but that's more important to me than doing a big fancy premiere in an opera house that actually maybe everybody hates. Like, I don't, do you know what I mean? It's kind of, um, yeah. and that's not just about pleasing them either. Sometimes the audience might hate it too and I love it. And actually this is the thing about being a disappointment and a happy artist. You've got to really fight to hold on to what you love and what you have to say, even when it's not popular. Yeah. Um, and, I, and even when you're disappointing everybody around you because they say, oh, you're a composer. like. Why haven't you written a, a hit jingle or a hip hop song or a hit musical yet? And I'm like, well, this is not really what motivates me. And I think there is a, this is when we talk about the tension between surviving and thriving, because like, obviously privilege plays a huge part. If you have financial privilege, then you can choose what projects you do, what kind of career you have, because you can take risks. Whereas if you're fighting to be freelance and struggling to earn enough money, which I experienced for the past few years, um, you have to take any project on and you have to try and please the people who are commissioning you because you need the money. And I think this is a really hard struggle as an artist. Um, and yeah, privilege plays, plays a huge part because if you don't have to fight, uh, you know, I've worked minimum, minimum wage jobs alongside doing difficult commissions. And that's with parents who have supported me financially as well. I'm not gonna lie and say I've had no financial support. Whereas there's plenty of composers who haven't got any any financial support at all. So how on earth can they always be true to themselves? That's a very, very difficult thing. Um, I think that's the, the most challenging uh, part, isn't it? For people who are, and there's so many uh, who have to do waiter jobs. So I, I, I had to do uh admin jobs uh at the beginning of my career as well to you know to continue to follow my dream and then at some point for these people uh, for all of us there are moments when you just feel like oh will i ever uh, do it and i think for me uh i think there are two things and see it was, uh, be interesting to see what you think but i think there are two things i'm not gonna say the being um a successful whatever that word is but uh, is a musician or an artist is an easy career. It's not an easy career, but I think a bit like you, I, I believe you are an artist. And if you are an artist, you will always be. If you don't become that, you're unhappy somehow and you live in this turmoil of not fulfilling or, you know, never being who you truly are and if you really are an artist you will find ways that's because you can't live without that so even if you put your own concert in your local church as you said and then you will find ways of fulfilling that but of course when you are struggling to pay rent and then you, you know you don't even get a commission you know i think when you when you talk about oh i need to take a commission for something silly some people don't even reached that stage yet so i think those are the people that we should maybe try to inspire as well to sort of okay um let's try not to stay inside the box i mean maybe for us for singers is only going for auditions yeah but maybe don't go on for auditions maybe put your own concert of so as a composer what would you what would be your advice for somebody for example doesn't even get a commission even if it's a bad commission that they don't want to do it uh, they are not even there but they really want to are you maybe would advise to show their music online or 
create a community. I think because the only good thing I'm thinking about social media at the moment is the power that we have now to actually connect with people who want to connect with us. Okay, if you and uh, if you don't want to follow me, fine. But if somebody wants to follow this discussion, for example, great, because they will be interested in that. And I think for a composer or any musician, uh, it can be a good thing uh, as well. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think a really crucial moment for me was realizing that um, it's okay to do a normal job to have that financial support. Sometimes that's teaching as well, which is very rewarding. Um, I've done quite a lot of teaching. Something that takes the pressure off so that when you, um, so that you don't have to be worrying so much about success in your composition. So if you haven't had any commissions yet and you haven't had any work yet, focus on financial stability. Like you need to have some income and that doesn't have to be music, just have something, but it also needs to be something that doesn't drain you and take away all of your creativity and time. So it's quite hard to find the right job, but I've done some, weirdly, some of the better ones were just like part-time call center jobs or something weird like that, where it's not very really glamorous, but it was not using my brain in a way that drained me. Yeah. Um, so I was able to compose alongside. So just starting from the bottom, that's the kind of thing I've done. And then with my music, I thought, okay, well, I've got my money now. I can pay my rent so I can do anything. So yeah, sharing things online, but actually, I think it's also important not to have to share immediately. I think it's important to give yourself the space to just develop and learn and make mistakes and and and, and study and, and improve without having to immediately be judged, you know? Because actually, if you put your stuff out there too soon, it's very, very vulnerable and, and you need to um, find the right spaces and times to do that. So um, I'm trying to learn not to always share everything I do immediately. I quite often wait a few months before I oh, share that's something. That long? Because, yeah. yeah, sometimes even a year, like, because it's, you have to remove yourself slightly so it's not as painful. And I think um, inevitably I'm so often disappointed, you know, so often I'll, I'll spend months and months working on something. And then even as someone who's had quite a lot of um, successes, <laughs> I have, I've been very fortunate. I'll make something that I care about deeply and then it will get absolutely no reception at all. Like nobody will respond to it. And I feel disappointed, but because I waited I gave myself a distance between the pain of creating it and the joy of creating it and all the emotions in there. And then this sort of more um, promotional side of actually sharing it. Um, if you share it immediately, then you can get crushed immediately. And it's very hard to build your confidence up again um, because it is always disappointing and vulnerable being an artist. You're never gonna get the reception that you dreamed of uh, you're always going to be critical of yourself you get, as well. You get the reception, which is completely the opposite of what you expected for other things. I had a, I have exactly a different, I don't wait so long to uh, share things, but I can tell you one thing, everything that I ever recorded, I almost never look at it or listen to it again, because <laughs> I always feel the moment you it's out there, you feel, oh, I could have done that better. And then I, I have a, a lovely sound engineer that we work uh, with at Donne, which is John Taylor. He's a, a god in the music uh, industry. And he said something to me that really is, uh, I, I always remember now. He said, well, Gabby, a recording is a photograph. It's, it's just a photograph. And that's that moment. So next time you take a different photograph, it's going to be another moment. Doesn't mean it's going to be better. And, and that, for me, that really means a lot now because I go, okay, that was my photograph of that moment. And I can never repeat that. And every concert, uh, for me, I'm much more like a live performer. I love performing live. That's for me, it's much more rewarding than recording, but uh, I know recording is important, uh, especially now with the project recording music by women is so important. Uh, but it's, it's, it can be 
soul killing you know <laughs> especially there are some some tracks you go oh i really like this one which is really rare i think for any artist to sort of yeah i think this one and then zero response <laughs> Exactly. And it's strange. And you can't, I think this is the thing about the, you know, when you mentioned a while ago in our conversation about music feeling like a capitalist system, there's only limited opportunities available and you've got to fight to get them. This is a lie because actually the people who make you feel that way are the gatekeepers who have the money and they want, they want to restrict because, well, actually, if you think of it from their perspective, they've got some money, they want to give it to the person they think is the most deserving but the thing is they their taste and their personal opinion comes so much into it so you've got to resist and believe your own taste and your own opinion as well because you need those opportunities but you can also create your own opportunities and this is going going back what you said about advice to people who haven't had many opportunities or commissions or anything you can create your own opportunities. It's very hard because you do need some money. And sometimes that means you have to apply for funding, which is hard work, or you do something as a labor of love while working a job alongside, um, or you find somebody else who's similar to you and you both, generally I'd say the best thing to do is find somebody else and collaborate with them. This is what I do all the time because as soon as you're not alone, it's so much easier because you can do the work together. You can apply for funding together. Um, you can keep each other motivated. Um, even if other people don't respond immediately, you can say to each other, like, this is really great. We're doing something really great here. Um, it's also more fun. And I think this is part about being happy. Like why be the solitary, miserable artist? Why not be with your friends and doing your art? And actually that's my favorite thing. And that's what keeps me going because I just go crazy by myself. <laughs> um, and there's a few other things I'm going to say. Advice, collaborate, collaborate, and uh, yeah. And I but think even if it's not, to... even if it's not collaborating on the same thing, like sometimes you need to give yourself the space to really nurture your own creativity. That's very important too, because sometimes if you go into collaboration and the other person's a lot more dominant than you, yeah. And I say this is quite a strident person as well. Um, you can end up sacrificing too much and I think it's very important to find people to work with where you know that they genuinely want you to succeed as well and it's about you as well because then that equality will take you forwards if somebody's just if you're just using somebody to get the exposure or they're just using you to get the exposure it's not a collaboration no. um, it's about finding people who value what you're doing as much as you value it and who enjoy it and who see something and that you will find generally is so much more rewarding emotionally <laughs> and artistically and artistically yeah, yeah but again the problem is it's always it always comes back to money because we're always saying well we, we need funding we need and and it is hard like i'm not i don't have the answers i'm gonna i'm not gonna pretend it's not hard like i'm still struggling with this all the time but it doesn't mean i don't have the dream still of, of staying true to what I actually enjoy doing. And I also think with this capitalist system with the envy and the limited opportunities, um, if you can fight that urge within yourself to, to feel envy, then you can start celebrating where you are right now a bit more because um, I realize like, if I'm always looking ahead to what I haven't done yet, and what I haven't, who I haven't pleased yet. Like, you know, oh, this person really wanted me to do this thing and uh, this person expects me to do this. And oh, my parents gave me some, some money a long time ago and I haven't proved to them that I'm the best composer in the universe. So have I screwed up? You know, I think we put so many like pressures on ourselves for the future. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm saying this is someone who's been privileged to have that help and support, but you need to look at where you are now and say, um, what am I actually happy doing now? And and I look at myself now and I think I get to compose every day if I want to, which is what my teenage self was desperate to do. Um, I've got loads of artistic friends who are amazing and I didn't really have any composer friends or many musician friends when I was younger. So I felt very alone and um, I have my health and there's, you know, there's a worldwide pandemic and I just value like the things like my health and my home and, and having food and having still the energy to make some art. And that is actually reminding me like, yeah, you can be a happy artist now, even though there's no concerts coming up, there's no, there's nothing to like, 
um, push myself towards, but actually I'm still making, still just enjoying it for what it is. Um, and I'm going to ask if people will have some questions in a minute, but before that, um, and people, if you have some questions, just type them. I also have a few here uh, that people sent it. Uh, would you like to say anything else before we go into questions? Anything I didn't ask you? I'm just looking at my notes to see whether there's anything really important yeah. in this. Um, I wrote something about role models. I think yeah. just really quickly, um, when I was younger, I was always looking for role models. And as a woman, I think it was harder because I didn't see as many women to look up to doing the kind of thing that I wanted to. I would find them, I did find them eventually, but, um, and I, I had male role models as well. You know, anyone could be a role model, but it is helpful when someone looks like you. And I think this plays into intersectionality. You know, this is why diversity is so important in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of disability. If you don't see role models who you can connect with, it doesn't give you that hope and that vision as easily. You can get it anyway, but then you become the exception rather than the rule. And actually it should be the rule that there are people yeah. like you to look up to. So that's a really important thing about, about role models. But then it's always crucial to also distance yourself from those role models and allow yourself to be yourself and say, I don't have to be the same. You know, and Gabby, you were saying you're looking at all these people and like, oh, look at what they're doing. And I, I really wish, I haven't done what they did and you know it, that's sort of them um, beating yourself up because you're not doing what someone else is doing i think it's very important to look at yourself now and say what am i bringing already and i'm not that person um and i, I and I, I needed some role models and i need role models but actually i need to be myself ultimately because you know they're human too i'm human and and we end up being role models for others but mostly because we've been ourselves that's usually what makes us a role model uh so that's a that's a balance as well i have a question here from uh Nuria. can you see it yeah so i'm gonna read it out loud just in case uh sorry um what made you want to do a phd and what is it doing for your practice is it what you expected? Um, just before I do that, just tell me if the sound goes weird because I just had to charge my laptop, but hopefully it'll be okay. Hi, Nuria. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, hope you're doing well as well. Um, yeah, so the PhD thing, this is again a balance between pragmatism and vision because I needed some stable income. I was really struggling last year, actually. I had a really big dip where I didn't have much money coming in. I applied for some regular jobs. I even applied for a full-time job in an insurance company because <laughs> I was pretty I was pretty poor at one point last year. Um, and then this PhD came along and I saw it and I thought, my goodness, I always said to myself that I would only do a PhD if my dream one came along, which would be making an opera, collaborating, and doing it in Manchester <laughs> and it had to be fully funded because I don't have any money so um it appeared like a vision my friend um sent it to me um Alexia sent it to me and if Alexia hadn't sent it to me I don't think I would have ever known it, it happened it, it existed so I was very very fortunate and grateful um and I thought, yes, firstly this is going to provide me with stable income if I get it because it's funded and then I can be less stressed for a few years because I've been juggling like 12 different things at one time for a few years and also it's my dream to research collaboration and opera um, and how often am I going to get a commission to do an a full opera with the BBC Philharmonic so I was like this is so exciting so um, I was very very fortunate to be accepted on that PhD and I've got a poet Miel Campbell who's my collaborator um, so that was why why I'm doing it. Um, what's it doing to my practice? Is it what I expected? Um, I think my practice is changing. I'm becoming more free to be myself again because actually all these commissions and teaching and minimum wage jobs and things I've been juggling for years, I've been trying very hard to fit into everybody's mold of what they need me to be for that job that I'm doing. Um, and with a PhD, you're a lot more free to pursue your own research 
and it's just making me feel like I can focus on learning and developing and not having to immediately create a product. There's no kind of snappy immediacy with it. It's, it's a long project and I actually need that. I need this time to develop and grow um, and know that I can pay my bills um, without checking my contract every five seconds to make sure I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> um, so it's freeing me up a lot. Um, it is it is kind of what I expected. I think it's, um, I'm just in the first year of it, so it's it's a bit easier in your first year. You're, you're given a lot of time to, to discover what you want to do. I think it will get a lot harder in the next couple of years. Um, but again, I will be battling with those expectations and, and, and vision, like vision and expectation are different things. So if I give in to the weight of expectation, I will lose my motivation with it. And I'll think, oh my goodness, I can't create the best opera ever in the world and I'm failing and I'm, I'm failing at the PhD. Whereas if I focus on my vision of wanting to create a good opera collaboratively with a poet, which is my vision, then I'll stay motivated. So that's my, my main learning. So I, I can only disappoint myself if I lose my vision I can't, um, I can't, I don't want to be disappointed by feeling that I'm not living up to all these, this duty and this expectation. That's not helpful. I have a question here um, from somebody sent from Instagram who wants to remain anonymous, but as I'm in my first year of composition degree and I'm the only uh, woman in my class. I'm, fi I'm finding it very um, disencouraging and I am thinking of giving up. What would you say to me? <laughs> I'd say, uh, firstly, it's very, it's very honest of you to, to acknowledge that you feel that way because it's completely reasonable to feel a bit lost when you look around and you feel like the odd one out. Um, yeah, thanks, Muriel. Uh, it's just uh, thanks. Um, thank you for for asking and, and reaching out because I think you've you've realised there are other people out there who who can encourage you, even if the people in your immediate environment aren't necessarily encouraging you. Um, and I'd say that try and find that wider community because just because you're at that particular institution with that particular group of people, that doesn't have to be your universe. So I'm really pleased that you've reached out to Donne, to us, um, because you're realizing there are other people out there who've gone through similar challenges. You know, when I was at university, um, <laughs> I was, I think, in my year, uh, in my undergrad, there were 75 people in my year. I think about 20 people did composition and there were about, I think it was either three or four, either three or four women in the whole year out of 75 took composition for their finals and I was one of those and I so often nearly gave up even though I'd had that dream of I want to be a composer you know I just felt so like overwhelmed in my first year um I got 55 percent for my composition portfolio I was not very happy <laughs> and I also didn't know any other girls who were doing it I in my immediate friendship group um, no one had decided to take composition in their first year who was a girl and I just thought oh and I'm rubbish as well so I'm letting women down and I'm not good enough and I, I don't know what to do so I, I did nearly quit um, but I actually talked to my I talked to my supervisor and I said look I'm really feeling very discouraged um, I was I was able to reach out and, and he encouraged me and I think I'm going to try and do that for you now. I, I don't know you, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to say, why Why do you want to compose? Or is it not that why you want to compose? What is it that, that draws you in? Because something's making you want to make music. Something makes you want to make sound. And even if you don't see people around you like yourself doing that, focus on, focus on what about it makes you happy. Um, because it's going to be hard as well. Maybe at university they're going to assess you on things that seem pretty crazy, like you'll be marked on your compositions and it might seem really unfair and you might get a bad mark like I did. Uh, I also didn't get a very good mark with my masters and I still kept going <laughs> because the people around you shouldn't get to decide that. You should decide for yourself. I like making noises. I like making music. I like making sound. And 
Um, even if people don't encourage you in, the, in your immediate environment, yeah, look around. There's a lot of there's a lot of women making music out there, and oh, I wish I could have a conversation with you and ask you more about it. Actually, um, you can write, write, me write to me. Anna on Instagram. Yeah, write me, send me an email because I'm just talking at you now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you. Exactly. Uh, and and keep... don't give up. Don't give up because um, no, don't give you'll up. really regret it if you give up. I I would have. Oh goodness me! If I'd given up after my first year, I don't know what I'd be doing now. But I don't think I'd be very happy because I love my job and you know I'm not I'm not in a group of boys now I think <laughs> um also like boys can boys can support me sometimes like some of my male peers are very encouraging and supportive and generous um but I think at university you have this feeling of like everyone's in it for themselves and very competitive so I think you don't get that in encouragement yet but it will it will come uh, please email me because this is, I'm not giving you the best answer and I'd love to talk yeah, to you about it. Don't give up, don't give up. <laughs> okay, I have, we, only have time for, we only have time for one more um, and, and then I also have my final question. Uh, but uh, this also came on the message. Uh, do you feel like you have to be less feminine to be taken seriously in the music industry world? Well, clearly not because look at her pink earrings. <laughs> my, sister made these. my sister has a jewelry business called Madame Marsh and she made these. She's exactly. just started. But, but, so but it's a good question. Working. It's a good question. They're very good. Um, yeah, so I'm very comfortable being feminine now, but I think when I started, I, I mean, I've said previously in this, in this live chat, I'm very comfortable being masculine and feminine. I'm comfortable with both sides of myself. Some days I feel very androgynous and some days I feel very feminine. But yes, in the professional sphere, the first few years, I cut my hair really short. I liked having short hair, that was fine, but I, I felt like I I didn't really realize that um, all my clothes that I would wear for professional events were like shirts and blazers and trousers and I had short hair and I didn't wear much jewelry and I felt quite, um, I definitely presented myself in a more masculine way because I think I felt more confident when I did that and um, partly because I was looking around me it's like the previous question about looking around just seeing boys around you I, I looked around and what I saw around me was masculine clothing and masculine behavior so I I emulated it because that's how I thought I should fit in and then now now that I've been doing it for a lot longer I, I feel like no I love being feminine as well and I love being a woman and actually there's a lot of strength in femininity and sometimes the loudest feminists are um are sometimes we've seen like less feminine feminists being the ones who are the most outspoken and it's really important that women are allowed to be masculine and allowed to be that if that's themselves you know some women want to be androgynous and want to be masculine but if you feel feminine and you want to express that you should because there's a lot of strength and power in it um something i was thinking about is like what does success look like in a feminist society and i think it's a really difficult question to ask ourselves because we've not seen it we don't know what it looks like to celebrate feminine power and what that even means it just sounds like um it can sound like nonsense to us because we think of success as as this masculine ideal um but it's, it's crucial it's always about it's crucial that women who feel masculine should be allowed to express that and feel comfortable and not feel criticized for it and women who feel feminine should be allowed to express that, you know, um, we need this, this balance because men too need to be allowed to be feminine and masculine and anything in between. And I think that goes back to the importance of the diversity in role models now that we we really, really need more and more. Okay, I need to... Yeah, I, just, I just want to bring in one more thing with that. I think we need to remember that um, ethnicity comes into this as well because actually, you know, as a white woman, there's a lot that I can't speak about from experience and I think um, gender and ethnicity hugely connected in terms of role models and expectations and yeah it's a really important thing to think about yeah I think when when I started this project it was it's really amazing of course we we do focus more on women and I think that was a decision because I am a woman and I am a woman in music but of course we can't forget that diversity should be the highest goal you know we we need representation of women of different gender of uh, different 
people color backgrounds it doesn't matter you know and i think there's been a history of, of um women making progress in feminism but it being like white women first and that yeah. just it's just so unfair and i think also it, there's no reason for it to be the case no reason for it to be like let's have a white female president and then let's have a yeah. female president of color like why or then let's have a trans president like why why then you know it should be together and we actually need that because otherwise it doesn't work progress and equality have to happen together but you're right to focus on gender in your project because we can't we have to focus on something and then we need to work together with people who are focusing yeah. on different aspects well thank you so much before we finish i i have um my final question for you so back to women in music so i think this is a question people ask me the most and uh, I think those sessions are being really helpful because it's going to help me to have better answers. Mm -hmm. So the, the, we have amazing talent out there, full stop, like uh, women composers, women performers, but in this case, let's talk about composers. We have access to their music much more than we ever had in the past. And yes, their music is out there, to be bought, to be found, to be... Uh, and we have amazing initiatives like Donne and like so many others. I can't mention because I always forget one and then it's unfair. Uh, we have an amazing initiative making this idea of finding this music easier <laughs> for everybody. But still, at least in my opinion, the move to achieve equality is really, the pace is very slow, right? To see this reflecting in concert halls, really, really slow. So in your opinion, one, what do you think is the main reason? Of course, I know it's more than one. And two, what can we do to make a bigger impact and create a real faster change? Yes, I mean, it's it's the biggest question because you can't make a career as a female artist if you're not given the same opportunities and the same money. Um, and those opportunities and that money come from concerts and audiences. Um, and at the moment, online audiences, but you know, in the future, it will be live, live programming again. Um, and I think for me, the main reason that it happens is two, one is that the audiences don't have the familiarity and so the programmers say well we need to do things that people know so that they buy the tickets because classical music is kind of an unstable art form if we just focus on classical music for now yeah. classical music is quite an unstable art form there's always more money is needed um so programmers are quite nervous about putting things on they don't think people will recognize because they worry that the tickets won't sell. Now, that's understandable for events that are like one opera, okay? Um, but if it's a concert with three pieces in, then it makes absolutely no sense. If you're gonna put a new piece in or a contrasting piece in the middle, why shouldn't that be by a woman? Or why shouldn't two of them be by women, but then you've got one really famous Beethoven piece that everybody wants to come and see. And actually a lot of ensembles are doing that now. So that's one way of, that's a problem and that's one way of combating it. Um, but with that familiarity thing, this idea of like household names, um, I think education is so important because if school children are taught female composers, then even if they don't study music, they will remember that name when they grow up. So if they hear that music in school, or um, then they will, as an audience, they'll, they'll be able to recognize that name. Um, and then also with that, I think crucially, um, as someone who's taught myself, I had to make a conscious effort to try and teach myself about music by women and how from the past and how it could be a model for composition. So that with my students, when I'm teaching them techniques for composition or music theory, I'm not just saying, look at this Bach or look at this um, Scriabin or look at Shostakovich. Um, I can say, look at this piece by Judith Weir, look at this piece by Ethel Smythe, look at this piece like Florence Price, look at this, you know, there's so many different people that I can say, here's a model, Kaya Sariaho, you know, like now, because of educating myself, I can think of all these pieces, but still, because 
I wasn't taught those at, at university and school. I have to make the extra time to learn so that I can actually use it as a compositional model. So teachers need to teach themselves what their teachers didn't teach them <laughs> so they can pass on the new knowledge to their students. And then their composing students, their performing students, their musicology students will have these names in their mind and this understanding of, of how women's music can provide a model and then when they go into the concert hall even if it's just a local concert or a big concert they are able and confident to perform that music to program that music because they understand it and i think you know i can sit in my piano and i can bash out some beethoven badly and i don't feel guilty because i'm like well hundreds of people are playing it well so that's fine but I have some music by Amy Beach that's piano music. And I think, well, I could play this, but and I do play it, but I don't want to play it to people like, oh, look at me performing Amy Beach because I haven't been taught about that music properly and I don't fully understand how to interpret it. So I really wish that somebody who is an expert on Amy Beach would teach me how to interpret that music. And I think this is, so it's all about canons and teaching for me and awareness. So that's it, expert on Amy Beach, right to Anna. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I, I feel like we can carry on talking for people who don't know. This is Anna's website for you to check her work. Please. My do. email's on there if you want to contact me. If I didn't answer anything very well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, and your social media is there as well, isn't it, on your website? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, guys, for being here with us. Uh, if you enjoyed this video please share with somebody who you think this video might talk to or you know resonate with please uh stay connected with us this is donna's website this is donna's instagram account this is donna's twitter because more than ever is really special and important for us to stay connected and i think I really believe, I, I, I never used to think that what I would say or do would really make much difference apart from in a concert hall when I was singing. But I think this project really taught me that a little bit can go so far and I can't change things alone and I can't do it alone, but I'm sure that together we can make a, a, a big difference. And uh, really, we already started a revolution, so we just have to keep going. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anna, again. Uh, feel Thank free to be sending uh, messages uh, to us, to Anna. And uh, we will see you tomorrow, actually. We want to talk to Rob Diemer uh, directly from New York uh, to talk about diversity in music repertoire, which is going to be a fantastic subject. Stay connected with us. Take care. Bye, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.